Okay, everybody, welcome back. It is a rainy Monday morning, uh, afternoon, uh, which is kind of weird for June, but uh, we are going to pick up where we left off on operating systems, and we're going to talk about readers and writers problems. I know I stopped around slide 54, but we'll start at slide 50 to re you know, recall the problem scenario so that we don't have to go um, back and uh, kind of try and remember where you picked up where we left off. What we're looking at is the classical IPC interprocess communication problems. Readers, writers, dining philosophers, and sleeping barber. Um, so these are three classic scenarios that occur when threads try to communicate with each other and they cause different situations. They're models. So they can be represented in terms of different scenarios, real life scenarios, and uh, they're usually labeled that way. So as an example, readers and writers. It's more of the database um, situation. Dining philosophers is usually used with I.O. devices. Um, but if you, uh, you know, talk about databases, you talk about I.O., what ends up happening is they, you know, it's hard to see the concept or the scenario, but it does apply to real world scenarios. Sleeping Barbara is a more of a, Barbara is more of a queue kind of thing <clears throat> with multiple people asking help desk questions and computerized call waiting systems and uh, incoming calls and routing scenarios or sleeping barber situations. So I uh, started talking about the readers and the writers and uh, in terms of this scenario any number of reader activities and any number of writer activities might be happening simultaneously which is why we get the database concept. <clears throat> so a database is out there and we do a query on it and we update stuff and we do a bunch of reads and writes essentially to a shared data repository and so at any one time anyone could be reading and anyone could be writing so uh, what we're looking at in uh, terms of coordinating those activities what order should we put them in how many readers can we allow how many writers at any one time a writer activity may want to modify the data a reader might want to read it or access it simultaneously so we have this sort of scenario that happens in terms of the active readers. So these are the people who are trying to read data. So if you have a value in there, let's say you're reading uh, ATM data, which uses a database for the most part, and you go to the ATM and, ATM and you want your current balance, <coughs> and then at another ATM, somebody else is logged into the same account, and they want to withdraw money. And so are they reading the current balance before or after a potential withdrawal? Once somebody opens it up, it's going to become stale as soon as someone starts writing something to it. So as a classic scenario, this actually used to happen in the past. You have an ATM and you have one ATM card, or you maybe have multiple of the same card and they have the same numbers on them. That's why we have different ATM numbers. Um, you log in on the same number by swiping your card or entering it in, providing your PIN. You're legally accessing your ATM card, but somebody else does it across town or next door to you. Uh, with the same card number, same thing. So you have two accounts, the account open twice, and then you have $20 in the account, and the first person who reads it in reads the correct balance. Second, second person reads it in reads the correct balance. One of the transactions does a withdrawal, so now the balance is zero. Well, the other one's still reading 20, so it does a withdrawal, so now the, net, the balance is negative 20, or negative $20, I should say. So if you're withdrawing $20. So you can possibly see what the scenario is about in terms of coordinating the readers and the writers. If somebody's got it opened up, why should you allow somebody else to open it up too? So the account should only be opened up once. So you give a different card number. You have a different card number. You're accessing the same account, but you're under a different transaction kind of ID. In that particular case, you're going to be locked out. So they say, sorry, not at this time. Can't update your account. Can't log in. Uh-oh, why is that? And then you wait because somebody else has it opened up for a read. <coughs> and it locks it. So if it locks it, you can't withdraw $20 twice. You can only do it once because you can't access it the second time. So you're causing the reads to fail, which is kind of weird, uh, because you have it opened up with a read with the anticipation that there might be a write. So you're blocking the writes. But perhaps you can open it up for multiple reads without allowing a write to happen. <clears throat> so that's the reader-writer scenario, if you think about it. So readers can enter in they could read the database all you want and then writers have to wait which is what I just described actually where you can't update it and a writer is going to withdraw the twenty dollars and it's going to write zero instead of twenty but somebody else has it opened up and it says twenty so the other scenario is are you going to block all the readers 
or change or update all of their values, how are you going to do that? So it's a little bit more problematic. So what normally happens is you block the writer. Well, here's a scenario with an active writer. What are you going to do? Block the readers. So the readers have to wait because the writer is updating something. You don't want the reader to read the wrong value if the writer is writing something. Um, so the access to the database for writers and one one shot deal as well. So, so if you're constantly having one at a time access, are you doing serial processing of your database? Yep. Uh, so how do you get simultaneous multi-processing of the database? So multiple transactions can happen simultaneously, and then you reconcile at the end of the night. <laughs> so what the banking industry does is it figures out, well, what can we allow during the day? Okay, we're going to make $100 available from your deposit. You know, that's a good risk. So you can withdraw $100 of that, but you can't withdraw the whole thing till midnight. You know, because at the end of the day, they have to go sort through, okay, you deposited this, you took this out, you did this, you did that. What happened with this account? Everything settles, clears out, and it's in a certain order. So it can predict the reads and the writes. It can actually kind of orchestrate itself to make sure that all of the transactions and every one of them works correctly. <clears throat> so you don't have any problem with um, you deposited a check, but then you did a withdrawal, and the funds weren't posted yet, so, you know, you have overdraft protection, so you get charged something. Well, that shouldn't happen if you already deposited it, but the bank didn't clear it yet, yada, yada. So the banks actually have a scenario, kind of a script that they go through with all these rules that they apply, and then it all happens at the end of the night when nothing's happening. So you really are doing a serial transaction, actually. Serial processing in a non-serial fashion, which is kind of interesting. So should readers wait for for waiting writers? Well, that's interesting. You have writers that are waiting, and now you have readers that are waiting, which is the classic scenario, and this causes the deadlock. So the reader's waiting in front of the writer who's waiting for the reader, which is really a circular wait that goes on. The reader must have to wait if you have a bunch of readers in here, and the writer must wait, but enters when all the readers leave, and when the readers aren't going to leave till the writer is done. <laughs> so causes issues. So in the problem of the reader and writer, the first reader-writer problem requires that no reader will be kept waiting unless a writer has obtained access to the shared data. So why keep the readers waiting for the writers? Unless the writer intends to write. Maybe the writer's just checking the balance, but not really writing. So, and then in the second reader writer problem requires that once a writer is ready, no new readers can start reading. Otherwise, we get starvation. So one of them causes a deadlock, the other one causes starvation. So if people are constantly reading, then the writers won't get a chance to write anything. So, or if the writer, readers are waiting for the writers to finish, they may never even get a chance either. So, um, <clears throat> so the solution is the first case writer may starve. Yep. And in the solution of the second case, the readers are going to starve. So it causes starvation, or it causes a circular wait situation when one's waiting for the other. So, uh, so the solution to the problem in the reader-writer problem. And this is how some of the logic has been built into some of these systems is to do a read count. So the read counter is a count that keeps track of how many processes are currently reading. If nobody's currently reading it, they'll let it go. So it's a counter. So somebody logged in, somebody else logged in. So you go to the ATM, you log in, and you want to update the balance. You want to do a deposit. Well, then it's going to say, what's the read count? Zero. OK, you can do it. If not, it won't let you do it. Or it'll queue it up, so you'll do it later or something. All right, then we have this mutex content. So mutex semaphore provides the mutual exclusion for the updating read count. So the read count gets updated correctly. So each one of the reads will increment it. And then the write semaphore might be used to provide mutual exclusion for the writers. So it's also used for the first and the last reader that enters into or exits out of the critical section. So it's a counter, again, that keeps track of the write activity. So. So that's the reader and the writer scenario happens with databases. So then we have this dining philosopher issue. Well, the dining philosopher is you get shared resources. So going back up to our definition up here, we have uh, 
processes that are competing for mutual exclusion to limit the number of resources such as I.O. devices. We have one CD-ROM drive and we have a bunch of people trying to use it. So here's the scenario of the dining philosophers and here's our little table with our chopsticks in this particular case. It started out originally with um, forks and spoons and spaghetti then it turned into rice and chopsticks over the years. So. I don't know, you know, you can change the scenario to your liking as well. Five philosophers are sitting around a circular table, and in front of each one is a bowl of rice, so spaghetti rice, and it, between them is a pair, uh, between each pair of people, there's a chopstick or a fork, so there's only five chopsticks. So you have an odd amount of resources and an odd, well, you have five chopsticks, but you got one, two, three, four, five, but they need two each. So they're not going to be enough. So it takes two chopsticks or forks to eat rice. So it got changed to chopsticks because the spoon, pe people don't understand the spoon and the fork anymore with spaghetti, but you're supposed to eat with a spoon and a fork. But anyway, chopstick, I guess, is easier to, to conceptualize. So while N is waiting, neither N plus 1 nor N minus 1 can be eating because you need uh, you need to let go of the resource in order to allow somebody so it's resource allocation so if you have you don't have all the resources you need you're supposed to let them go to get rid of the problem otherwise if you hold on you get a circular weight that happens in a circular so each one thinks for a while this is why they call it dining philosophers because they're thinking they think for a while gets a chopsticks that are needed eats and then puts the chopsticks down again in an endless cycle so it illustrates the difficulty of allocating resources among processes with deadlock and starvation. And these guys will literally starve <laughs> if they don't get two chopsticks. <laughs> so, um, so what do we got here? The challenge is to grant requests for chopsticks while avoiding deadlock and starvation. Deadlock can occur if anyone tries to get their chopsticks, all, if everyone tries all at the same time, multiple programs competing, in, which is actually called a race condition, for the resources simultaneously, we have not only a race condition, but we're going to end up with a deadlock or starvation, depending upon what happens. The deadlock can occur if uh, everyone tries at once, and uh, each gets a left chopstick and is stuck, because there's five chopsticks. So each one of them could pick up a chopstick, but they can't get the right. So each right chopstick is uh, someone else's left chopstick, and then they sit there. That's a deadlock. They sit there and wait because no one's putting anything down. Everyone's just waiting to eat. So that's a deadlock. So here's our scenario. How, do we, how are we going to avoid this problem? Well, if you don't have both, you put one back. So, which is how the operating systems themselves actually allocate resources. So if the process can't get everything it needs, it puts everything back and tries again. Wait, wait, try again. So each philosopher is a process in uh, one uh, sum of four per fork. And so it could do process, repeat, think, wait, wait, eat, signal, I'm done eating, uh, and keep basically going back and forth in terms of it. But um, put it down if you don't get what you need, uh, but then they're doing a wait. So the first attempt, the deadlock, the deadlock if each philosopher starts by picking up the left fork or the chopstick, if they do it all at the same time. So you can order the number of processes so that only one process works at a time, and then that will actually work. But they can't work all. If you take this out of a multi-processing environment and do a serial approach with this, it actually works because you only have one philosopher at a time working, and then the next one, and then the next one. By the time the first one's done eating, the last one's ready to eat, so it'll actually be orchestrated. But you have serial processing. You don't have simultaneous processing. So the solution to avoid the deadlock is allow at most only four to be sitting at the table at a time. Limit the number of processes. So you only have four instead of five. And then uh, the odd number philosopher picks up the left fork first and even uh, picks up the right fork. So the weakness of the semaphores, well, the user is expected to write, wait, and signal to the right order. Well, how do we know the order? So the user must remember to execute the signal for each exit. So the calls may be spread throughout the program, and the logic may depend on uh, whether the process must check and signal its peers. How do you know if it's going to check and signal? So if you re re review the logic, you see that you have to balance the resources out. 
so this is why a lot of people actually add more memory to their computer because you have more resources <laughs> rather than having something wait or at most only loading up a certain amount of programs or not using another program that's memory intensive or something. So you can, you can actually juggle that resource as well. Memory is a resource. So monitors are another approach to the problem so that um, if, for example, and here's monitors here, uh, in terms of the concept, it, it's a new language construct that includes synchronization. So this is what you do in Java, actually. And you put synchronization, creates a monitor. And the monitor is implemented in terms of the Java synchronized keyword, which is another concept that you can actually um, use. So only one process can enter a monitor used for entry points at a time, which means you're going to create serial processing. So synchronize, which is actually kind of interesting, the word synchronize means like you're going to synchronize something, like multiple things are going to, I always think about synchronized swimmers, you know, and all the legs are going up at the same time, and all the arms are going down, synchronized <laughs> dancers and stuff. But it's the opposite. It's preventing that from happening. <laughs> so it's only one person that's got their leg up in the air. Everybody else has got them down. So, because it only allows one. So it's kind of weird. Why do they use the sync? If they put serial on there, then people go, well... That doesn't work. But synchronized sounds so much more sophisticated, right? So I don't know. The naming of some of these things or these concepts is kind of counterintuitive or kind of opposite. So, for example, a compiler might generate a call to a common semaphore on entry, signal, and exit. It's only one at a time is going to run, essentially. So process P makes a monitor call and process Q is in the monitor. Then P will block until Q exits serial processing. So here's our Java example. And we put the word here, synchronized, so public synchronized void deposit. This is the uh, banker's algorithm, deposit and withdrawal. Or it could also represent the readers and the writers scenario as well. Or we have an account balance, and then we have a, an account that gets created. This is the object that gets created. And then we have a synchronized double get balance, because we only want to get balance one time. Nobody else can be getting balance simultaneously. And then a deposit, withdrawal, stuff like that. So in terms of equivalence, monitors and semaphores have the equivalent power. Semaphores are generally implemented by operating systems. Monitors are generally implemented by application programs, like Java programming languages, and utilities that run on top of the operating system. <coughs> but they're doing the same thing. So are you doing the control from an operating system level or are you doing it from an application level which is really just a big difference anything you can do with a monitor you can do with a semaphore proof you can implement a monitor with a semaphore actually you can implement one with the other if you're working on an operating system that allows you to program with semaphores why not yeah, it's practically it's more sophisticated to actually do it that way if you're doing it in Java you don't have to the language itself the JVM supports the semaphores so it does it through it does it through synchronize. So anything you can do uh, with one, you can do with the other. So, so a little summary of the inter-process communication the IPC common scenarios. So we've seen two problems: critical sections uh, cannot both be modify a modifying variable simultaneously, and the concept of synchronization, which is the ordering. So it must define an ordering which is interesting because it's the exact opposite of what you think it would be. Often the problems are combined into two, so the readers and writers are shared storage and readers wait while their writers are waiting and vice versa. So it's difficult to use semaphores correctly. Um, it's one of the challenging problems that we get when uh, working with multiple threads and multiple processes. Mm -hmm. So while we have language support for monitors, sometimes standard Unix kernels will only support semaphores. So that's why in a especially for the first assignment for this course. You have to program it on a Windows, excuse me, on a Unix system or a Linux system, or use Java. Java as a programming language supports IPC. Uh, Windows doesn't. So if the language doesn't support it, the operating system doesn't support it, you can't program in it. <laughs> so long story short, that's why uh, it helps to have a, access to a Linux disk or something to to write that with, or do it in Java. And I gave you the option, you can do it in Java as well. So, so that concludes the IPC lecture and the concepts of the threads and the processes as they are obscene from an operating system level abstraction. So our next topic is a very popular one. It's CPU scheduling. 
So we have threads, we have processes, we've gone through that the last couple of weeks. So the scheduling says how are we going to run them? <laughs> so CPU scheduling takes a resource and schedules processes. So some people call this process scheduling. It's really CPU scheduling because what we're doing is we're figuring out how are we going to run the processes. So the CPU is running everything. So the basic concept of the CPU scheduling, scheduling criteria, scheduling algorithms, multiple process scheduling, real-time scheduling, thread scheduling, operating system examples are going to be covered next. Um, I'm not going to look at JIT. Java thread scheduling because it's kind of automated, but I'll show you some examples of that as well. Basic concept. So the mystery behind CPU scheduling. We want to maximize the CPU utilization and we want to obtain multi-programming. We're working with a serial processing system. So that's why we started out with DOS with serial processing, batch processing, where we have one program runs, the next program runs, the next program runs. And then humans came up with multiprocessing on a serial processing system. So on a serial processing system, we have one CPU. If we want multiple processing, we should, put, we should technically put on multiple CPUs. But it hasn't been until the last couple of years that we actually have dual CPU systems. And we still don't have the mainstream. Right now we have dual processors that work together. So we still are working with a serial processing mode with two CPUs. Because the operating systems, well, I shouldn't say Windows 8 probably does take advantage of multiple CPUs at this point, but previous operating systems haven't. Um, they're work still working on a single mode concept. What does that mean? Well, everything must happen at the CPU level, so all processing is dependent upon the speed of that CPU. <laughs> so the CPU can be measured in the terms of I.O. bursts and burst cycles. So processes execute, they can consist, the process execution consists of a cycle of CPU execution and also I.O. wait and wait time. We double click on a program and run a program. If that program was running on an island of its own, it'd get 100% of the CPU time. The CPU would just read each one of the instructions and process it. Send it to here, send it to there, no problem. Problem is we, do we double click on two programs. <laughs> we have one running, now we have another one running, and then another one running, and another one running, and lo and behold, we're actually running it on top of processes that are also running. So we have, at one moment of time, only one instruction being executed. But we have to share the CPU among all of those different processes that are running. That's CPU scheduling. So the concept is, how are you going to share it? Are you going to put them all in the same queue? Um, are you going to make multiple level queues? What algorithm are you going to use to select the next process that gets to run? And then how much wait time is each one of those processes or what are they going to get? And should we treat them all the same or should we put a priority on some processes? Because if you think about it, it's kind of like priorities in life. Some things have to happen and if they don't happen, nothing else is going to happen. As an example, if you had uh, an empty gas tank and you had a bunch of errands to run, I say getting gas is probably a higher priority than running all your errands because if you start running the errands with an empty gas tank, you're going to run out of gas and none of the errands are going to get done because you're going to be stuck on the side of the road. <laughs> so the operating system has to think that way too. So usually everything at the kernel level, all the kernel level threads have a higher priority. If the operating system's not running, Microsoft Word's not going to run on top of it. It's just that's the, it's a scenario of waiting at the side of the road with an empty gas tank. And none of those errands are going to run when you probably should have got the gas first. <laughs> so the operating system needs to make sure that its scheduler is running, its memory manager is running, its process, its, its process control block is properly organized and it's running correctly. All that stuff is happening way before any user program is going to work. And then if the operating system has to do something, it's going to interrupt what the user is doing and it's going to go ahead and do its own processing. So a lot of operating systems wait for idle time. You might notice this on older computers, actually. You know, your computer, you have a notebook computer. It's been sitting there, and you've been using it. And then you go somewhere, you come back, and what is this doing? Like all the, the noise is on. It's making noise. The fan started. Everything's happening right now. Like, What's going on? Is the operating system taking care of its stuff while you were gone because it waited for you to, to take a break? You don't take a break, and it's going to automatically do stuff. 
which is why I don't like stuff that runs in the background. So a lot of the you know antivirus software and software updating got a little crazy for a while. It's gotten better, but it got really crazy for a while. You'd be like trying to like, okay, I have five minutes before I have to leave the house and I want to check my email. And the email program's updating. It's like, well, why, why, why do I want that? I just want to check my email. Like you have a higher priority. I don't care about the state of my computer system right now or how I update my software is. I just want to check my email. And then it prevents you from doing that. So or it takes longer to do it. And then people turn off the updates. Well, that got a little obsessive for a while. People just, everything was just updating to the point where the computer was just updating itself constantly. That was my biggest complaint with Windows, actually, back when I used to. And then I got off of Windows. And I didn't want antivirus software and all these automatic update crap going on all the time. So Mac's got a lot less of that crap going on. But then and people got smart and went, well, maybe we don't want all that. So more modern versions of software programs don't do all that. <laughs> Just wait. Don't update every five minutes, you know. So, Or allow the user to turn it off. So anyway, long story short. I was discussing priorities and how, as a user, we don't really have that much priority that we can do. In a Unix system, we have foreground and background processes. That's about as high as level as we can get. So a foreground process runs faster than a background process. It gets more CPU time. It gets scheduled more often because the user is working with it. If it's in the background, we don't care about it. Just whenever you finish, you finish which means it's at a lower priority. From the kernel level to the user mode, everything from the kernel level is going to have a higher priority than the user mode. So it's kind of like uh, the user can just do foreground, background, the kernel does everything else for you. So we generally look at CPU burst distribution. We have a resource that's going to run constantly. That's the CPU. If it does run constantly, it heats up, which is why we have CPU fans. So the more you run it, the hotter the computer's going to get, so you got to put a little fan on there, cool it down a little bit, you know, especially if it's a fast-running CPU, depending upon what kind of resources it's using. Um, so, and you want to run it, you want to have full CPU utilization, you want that thing to run constantly. Well, if you run it constantly, then you have a lot of fan noise and it eats up the battery, because you have something that's running constantly. So a lot of computer operating systems, or a lot of operating systems for modern day hardware say, well, let's just minimize the CPU usage, slow it down a little bit. So sometimes they'll downclock it so it won't run as fast. What does that mean? Well, your computer won't get as hot and your battery won't burn up as, as fast. You see, get longer battery life. Uh, then they've discovered, well, that's not a good solution. It makes your computer run slower. It gives you the illusion that you've got less par power. It's just because you're not using it. Uh, so... And they figured, oh, well, then put a fan on the CPU. Okay. Well, then get better battery technology so you can support a faster processor. So it's like the chicken before the egg. How are you going to fix the problem? Alternating sequences of CPU and I.O. bursts. This is what we're looking at next here. So imagine the CPU is running. What's it going to run? It's going to flip between all the different processes that are running. What you want to do is 100% CPU utilization if you're the operating system and you want to run things as fast as possible. Now things are going to slow you down. We have this thing called context switching. If a CPU is running an instruction for one process, it's got a switch now between process A, B, C, and D. All the time it takes switching between these three process, four processes is wasted CPU time. But it's got to spend time to switch. So you have context switching time. So although you might have a 100% CPU utilization, it's not always spent processing instructions for programs that we're running. A lot of the time, well not a lot of it, but a good percentage of the time is wasted in context switching. I say wasted, kind of like, well, it has to do it, so it's not wasted. But you're not getting anything done and it's slowing down. So the uh, degree of the level of context switching needs to be maximized or minimized or adjusted to the degree of level of desired multi-programming. So there's a fine line between how many programs do we want to run constantly and how much CPU context switching are we going to suffer with if we run it all constantly versus not having the ability to run all that stuff constantly. So you might notice on your computer if you run five programs, just load it up and constantly switch between them, the computer will run slower than if you had three programs or two programs or one program which is why a lot of people like to close stuff. 
close it down. Why? Because then you don't have as much context switching. Your CPU will run faster. The entire computer will run faster if it doesn't have to juggle between all those different processes. So shut it off if you're not using it. <laughs> don't minimize it. Just close it. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're going to end up wasted CPU time with stuff you're not even running anymore. It's still in the queue. It's still being scheduled. It's still being looked at. But the context switch is going to go over, hey, oh, you're minimized. Okay, leave you alone. <laughs> okay, hey, oh, you're minimized. Okay. All those things until it gets, oh, you're running. Okay, we'll run another instruction. And then, okay, you're done. And back to the, hey, you're waiting modes, which is ridiculous, actually. But it allows you to have the illusion of that you have multiple programs running, and you do have multiple programs running. Uh, it's just not, they're not all running at the same time, however. Uh, so here's an example here where we're going to load, store, add, store, read from file, and then we're going to wait. And then we're going to do something, and then we're going to wait. And then we're going to do something, and then we're going to wait. So we constantly switch between I.O. calls and CPU calls. We have a CPU burst. Then we have an I.O. burst, then we have a CPU burst, then we have an I.O. burst, back and forth. So one of the things uh, you might want to consider is that um, you know, in modern day, modern day configurations, we have multiple queues with multiple processes that are bound for multiple resources. So we can divide out the I.O. So if you're in, it, let's say, for example, you're um, at the train station and you show up and you have to wait in one line. All right, actually, this happens at the airport all the time, too. And if they could just figure out how to minimize the amount of wait time at an airport, the, context, the amount of context switching that goes on at the airport would be reduced significantly. You show up and you get in the southwest line. Well, you got people who are leaving at two hours from now. you got people who are barely going to make their flight. It's like the flight's five minutes away here. This happens to me all the time when I'm running late. And lo and behold, there'll be a long line. It'd be like all these people could have just come in later, but they're here now and they're taking up space in my line and it's preventing me from getting to the line fast enough so that I can actually catch the flight that I might be late for I might be running behind on. So if you take all those people, which is what they do, they go, is there anyone here on the 12 o'clock flight? <laughs> yes, I am. Get out of the line and have a higher priority for those people, which is what the CPU does in terms of its scheduling. If you're looking at priorities, it'll take, well, these people need to be at the front of the line. These people don't need to be in line. Those people over there have a two-hour wait. You know, put them at the end of the line and readjust everything. Well, you can also do another thing what the airports do. It's like we have one line for Southwest, one line for United, one line for Alaska. You just separate it all out. So all the I.O. devices have their own queue. So you don't have to wait in one line because there's a huge flight that's overbooked that everyone's waiting for for one airline and you're clogging up the system for everybody else. So the CD-ROM drive is busy completely but you're in the queue and you're waiting for a USB port. Well you're stuck because people are waiting for this CD-ROM drive <laughs> which is what you get on the traffic. Actually this is highway traffic. All these people want to go off on the exit and you're stuck because you can't get around all these people that are waiting for the exit. So you're stuck there waiting gridlocked because the exit's blocked. Like, hello, just get out of my way. So if you did that, then you wouldn't be waiting for a USB port when it's open and ready to go, but someone is hogging up the CD-ROM drive. So it's a matter of routing, and think of it sort of like freeway traffic. The CPU scheduler's got a route. So it's constantly routing to this device, to that device, and in between, everyone's got to get CPU bursts. Because the funny thing is, is that it's kind of like the CPU is the traffic guard, and it has to go. It has to determine what route you're going to take. If you don't get a CPU burst, you don't know what route you're going to take. So unfortunately, the CPU controls everything. So if you get a separate CPU in there to control the scheduler, so once CPU controls the scheduler and the operating system, the other CPU actually runs everything. Then you got a fast running system, which is what's going, which basically the modern day configuration is. So, you, if you actually have dual processing going on, you got one guy controlling everything and you got another guy running everything. So, that's what you get on most of your tablet devices, your Motorola's, your, your Droid, Bionics, all that stuff with the uh, two processors. Well, one of them is processing all the incoming calls and the text messages and the traffic guard and the CPU, the other one's used for your applications to run everything. So you get really fast processing because you don't have to wait for some 
call to come in while your app is running. Your app doesn't have to wait for phone services and stuff like that to happen. It just happens simultaneously. Well, it is because there's two processors going on in that, which is great, actually. So modern-day tablets are running that way as well. Anything that has a two processor in it. And so most people, when those two dual processors came out, they're like, why do I need two processors in my phone? <laughs> like, well, it's because we can separate the workout. <laughs> we can actually have two things running at once. So anyway, well, you get that with the window. If you've seen that ad about the $299 <laughs> Windows Media and uh, Windows 8 tablet thing, whatever the sale price dropped on that. Well, it's those tablets have two processors in it. iPads only have one. You can only run one thing at a time on an iPad. You're really switching between one application, one app that's running, and then you have stuff that interrupts it. If you have a uh, phone services or anything, the call's going to come in. It's going to interrupt what you're doing. It's going to enter on the tablets that have two processors. You don't have that. So it's actually you can run multiple programs, multiple windows simultaneously because you have multiple processors running on that sucker. So there's a, but it's generally more expensive, however, unless you put cheap processors in there. So that is what makes a process cheap. Processor cheap is the technology. So you go with bad technology that's faster. <laughs> Does that mean well, it's probably going to wear out faster? I don't know. There's pros and cons to the whole scenario. So. All right, so we've been looking at this I.O. burst versus, and then these are just um, low-level instructions that are being processed to switch between I.O. bursts and CPU bursts, I.O. bursts and CPU bursts, long story short. Here's a histogram of CPU burst times and the burst times with a duration. So what does this mean? It depends on how frequent. So if you got five processors, excuse me, five processes, five jobs, and you have one processor, one CPU, are you going to give all five 20 bursts? Are you going to give them 10 bursts, 5 bursts? For the duration, how long are they going to get CPU time for? The longer they get CPU time for, the slower each one of the jobs is going to actually run, but the faster they're going to complete in the long run <laughs> because they're going to get time. So it's going to run, 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 okay, stop. Run, 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 okay, stop. Run, 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 okay, stop. If you give them shorter amount of times and you don't have that many to flip through, you're going to spend a longer time flipping through them and they're going to run slower. If you have a lot of jobs in the system, so the fewer number of jobs, the more CPU time you can give them, the longer the burst. The more number of jobs, the less amount of CPU time you want to give them because otherwise you're not going to get to one. You got ten jobs in the system. It's going to take longer to get to the tenth. The tenth one's going to, you know, not necessarily be running, especially if you get a long CPU time for all one through nine by the time you get to ten. So there's a balance. So when we divide out the queues for the processes, we also vary the queue time is also going to be very is going to be determining the frequency and the duration. So we have a very short term processing queue. So we have short, medium, and long. Going, I'm going back to short, medium, and long process queues. We stick the processes in these queues. Short-term processing queues aren't staying there very long. They're getting a long CPU time, or are they getting a short CPU time, depending upon the configuration that we're doing. They could be getting a long one because they're going to finish. So you have one job, and it's going to finish, and then it's going to get out of the queue. Another job. If you're just trying to get the queue done then you're going to give it a longer burst time. However, here's the problem with the scenario. This is what makes CPU scheduling so interesting, actually. What if it only needs five bursts and the scheduler is going to give it ten? Is it going to sit there and wait idle for five more bursts? So job number one comes in and we get five bursts. Okay, we're waiting five more before job number, or is it going to be preempted? Is the burst time going to stop? The time it takes to build into the algorithm to stop it short might be longer than just letting it run. <laughs> so we have an adjustment that can be made. Depending upon the operating system, we have self-adjusting queues that say, if the average time it takes is this amount of time, let's divide it out by the number of jobs that's in here, then we can figure out what the optimal amount of CPU time might be for each one of the processes, Then it's going to get some CPU time. But the time it takes to do that is time consuming. 
anything you're doing a calculation wise any inefficiency you have in the algorithm any updating you're doing with the algorithm slows down the CPU because the CPU is going to be spending time doing that versus running the processes so we've uh, throughout the years and experimentation there's been many different scenarios that's the CPU scheduling scenarios that are um, sort of interesting so the burst times are high uh, high frequency uh, short burst times low frequency bigger burst times so it depends on how many uh, algorithms how many jobs are going to be scheduled and what kind of queue it is you're going to adjust the burst time to maximize the efficiency of the particular frequency uh, frequency versus duration so so high frequency uh, short duration because we're going to get all those jobs out of there if we have a long duration with a high frequency, we're going to have some processes that don't even get that don't even run for like 10 minutes. That's going to give you a slow responsiveness. If you didn't click on something immediately and nothing happened, <laughs> you actually this happens occasionally. It's because something else is running. You click on it, hey, it's not starting. Click on it again, click on it again, and you got like five versions of Word up. You know, you go, how'd that happen? So you want it responsive. You don't get responsiveness if you have a long CPU burst time and you have a lot of program, you have a high frequency. For a long time, not going to run. So you're not going to get very much responsiveness. So we have many different types of scheduler algorithms and techniques to choose from. So the CPU scheduler by default, all of them do the same thing. They select from among the processes in memory that are ready to be executed, ready to run, and they allocate CPU time to one of them. And then they put it back in the PC, they update the process control block, they select another one. Give that some t CPU time. When that one's done, put that one back in the process control block, select another one, which is what they're doing. So th that's the nature of a CPU scheduler. And uh, the decisions may take, uh, may take place when a process switches from running to waiting state, um, switches from running to ready state, and these are the process states. And uh, switches from waiting to ready, or when it terminates, when the process terminates, then um, we might be able to, um, you know, determine what's going to happen. So scheduling under one and four is non-preemptive, and all of the other one is preemptive. What does that mean by preemptive? Well, if we just let the processes run and we don't stop them, so preemptive uh, as a word means to stop it short. To, to, to no, don't let it run continuously preempt it, stop it short. Well, if we don't stop them, we don't get multi-programming processing. We get serial processing because the process is going to run until it's done. <laughs> so, and then nobody else is going to be able to run. However, if we're under one through four, if we go a non-preemptive under one and four, one is the switching from running to waiting state. We can't preempt it. It's non-preemptive. Or number four, if it's terminated, don't stop. Just let it go. It's done. <laughs> so if it's a terminated process, we don't need to schedule it anymore. So all the other ones we preempt. That's how we... And so if we're going to preempt, it's really the preemptive strategy that the scheduler is actually working with. What are you going to preempt? Well, are you going to preempt an I.O. job? Probably not. If you're going to read a file from a disk and load it up into memory, if you preempt that job, then you're going to get half of it into memory and they're going to keep track. Well, how much of it do we have in memory? Where is it? Okay, update that. The, the cost of, of saving all that information is going to be higher than if you just let it run to its end. And then, we're, again, we're trying to minimize the context switching. That's a context switching cost. It's kind of like you decide you want to wash your car. So you put everything out in the driveway, get it all ready to go. It takes some time to prep for this if you're going to wash your own car. That's just why I don't wash my car. I just take it to the <coughs> car wash. It takes too long. And then the phone rings. You're going to answer the phone? All right. So me, my answer. Are you, okay, I have to go somewhere. So you're going to put everything aside, get in your car, drive it somewhere, and then come back. And the cost of putting everything back to get it all ready to go again, to, you might as well just wash your car and then deal with everything else after that. So it's kind of like how people, you know, oh, I want to uh, clean the bottom of the drawer. So you take everything out of the drawer. So you can clean the drawer. 
Are you going to put everything back in the drawer so you can use it and then take everything back out again later to clean it later because you decided you don't have enough time right now to clean it? It's just, it, it's the thinking that goes into it. So most of your I.O. jobs aren't going to be preempted. We don't want to like read half a song, figure out that where are we going to stop with the song? We might as well just start all over again, read it all over again, or stop, stop, stop. So we just let it run because it's faster just to let it run than it is to stop it and then restart it up again later. So we have a dispatcher. The dispatcher is the one who's picking. It's kind of like the radio dispatchers that we get with the 911 system. And they send out the fire truck or the ambulance or the they send out whatever it is you need. Well, the dispatcher is going to send the process to wherever it needs to go. So dispatcher module is a software module that gives control of the CPU to the process, selects from the short-term scheduler, and this involves switching the context. And when you switch the context, that means to go from one running process to another. It's the context. They call it con they call everything context switching in terms of the CPU scheduler. Because you're going from here to here to here to here to here. So I don't know if there's a better word for that, but it's called context switching. Uh, switching to the user mode from the kernel mode back and forth as a context switch. Jumping uh, to the proper location in the program uh, to restart that program. So we have a program counter that we can keep track of that says, here we are, here we are, here we are. And then we can use the registers that are close to the <coughs> CPU, which is why memory closest to the CPU runs faster because it has direct access from the CPU. What you don't want to do is have the CPU go all the way out the secondary storage, find something and load it up into memory, that's time consuming. We get that when you take a USB drive and you put an operating system on it and you boot to the USB. You're just asking for a slow operating system. You're just asking for something to run very slowly. Where you load all the operating system files on the hard drive and you make a hard drive run slower. So the MacBooks actually were kind of interesting. They put solid straight, faster drive, faster seek time on the drive. You have an old computer, put a solid state drive in there. 20-30% faster processing right there. Because it's running, it's going out to a, a faster running uh, memory. So mm -hmm. the entire system boots up faster. What you don't want to do is put like an old slow hard drive in a system and put an operating system on it or load it from a USB drive. Because you're going then out through USB channels, which is going to be slower than any other channel, like SCSI channel, which is going to be faster, or ID channel, which is going to be faster. Mm -hmm. So, Anyway, long story short, uh, we can uh, make use of registers. We can make use of cache memory and main memory so that we can load and, st we can load and unload from these faster memories that are closer to the CPU to create faster processing. It, creates, it reduces the amount of context switching time. So we don't have to spend as much time context switching. So if we can reduce the context switching, we can make the process run faster because we don't have to go way back out into a slow memory. So jumping from uh, one, pro one proper location in the program to another or restarting the program is also considered part of the dispatcher job. So we have dispatcher latency. And that's the time it takes for the dispatcher to work. So the time it takes for the dispatcher to stop one process and start another processor. <laughs> process running. Well, sometimes that's when you call 911 and it says, oh, what's your emergency? Or it takes her five minutes to answer the phone. That's dispatcher latency. Oh, it's busy. No one's going to answer. Okay, now nah, someone, okay, uh, uh, hold on one second. Let me grab a pen. <laughs> that's dispatcher latency. Uh, what is it, your problem? Can you say that one more time? I didn't get it. Uh, uh, so you haven't, probably would notice that the, these guys are already there's no dispatcher latency. Well, there shouldn't be any. If you if you have a perfect emergency response system running, no dispatcher latency. The person already has a pen. The person's already got you know just buttons they press. Oh, you want the fire department? Here you go. <laughs> Click a button. You know they already have your address, your telephone number. They already know who you are from the information that came through the electronic system. So, so hopefully the CPU scheduler has that stuff too. It's stored in the process control block. So the PCB stores all the stuff needed to reduce the amount of processor uh, dispatch latency. Well, what does that mean? The more information you store in the process control block, the harder it is, that, well, the larger the search, search space, the harder it is to find the information. So there's a compromise between how much dispatcher latency you want 
with what degree of multiprocessing you want, with what information are you going to store about the process, and then is that process going to be updated correctly. So it's kind of like when you call in a 911 dispatch, but uh, you just moved into this apartment and you haven't registered, you know, your nobody knows you live here and it sends you out to the wrong, it sends you out to your old address or something. It's like, wait a minute, that's outdated, that's old. So. So we have a criteria that goes along with scheduling, so scheduling criteria. So what do we have here? We have the CPU utilization. Uh, well, what is that? It keeps track of CPU and busy, it makes the CPU as busy as possible. So when evaluating, and this is a good slide, this is slide number uh, eight of uh, lecture number five. You're going to need this because one of the assignments I'm going to go over today at the end is uh, having you write a CPU scheduler, CPU comparing CPU schedulers, and you have to schedule on this criteria. So what does that mean? You're going to have to figure out, if I have CPU scheduler A, B, and C, which one's better? Well, actually, you only have to do two. I haven't even talked about the schedules yet, but when I talk about the schedules, you're going to know which one to pick from, hopefully. So you're going to pick two schedulers, and you're going to compare the two of them. So actually, let me take a brief brief side uh, tour through the assignments, uh, which means I actually have to download the assignments. Hold on one second. Just to make sure we actually have a CPU scheduling assignment, which I believe we do. Uh, let me just save them all, actually. I'm pretty sure I left this one in. We're all familiar with assignment number one, that's the shell. <laughs> all right, so assignment and everyone's uh, working on that one, I hope. Assignment number two, let's just take a quick look here. Is lo and behold on CPU scheduling. <laughs> so as you would have imagined, just as I was, I was remembering, which is good there, actually. Let's take a brief look at this assignment because you can start thinking about it now. You're going to need to wait for another lecture if this is new information for you. You're going to have to wait another lecture in order to get everything for it. But um, what are you going to do for assignment number two? Well, that slide I stopped on is relevant because that's the information you're going to use. So let's make this a little bit bigger. Well, I can go one more here. Let's go a little bit bigger. Let's see. You're going to read chapter five, which is on the concept of CPU scheduling. Uh, if you don't have the book, you can probably get a PDF copy of it. But you're probably going to want to read the chapter because it's going to give you more implementation details. So what are you going to do? The CPU schedule is an important part, obviously, we've been talking about this morning, of uh, the operating system. It's probably one of the most important components um, for, for the user experience, actually. Processes must be properly scheduled or the system will be inefficient and it won't run anything. It will seem slow or sluggish. So different operating systems have different scheduling requirements depending upon the nature of the programs that are running. So Windows is a very user experience, user level experience, which means your CPU is processing a lot of graphics, um, a lot of data that's being read from files and from um, I.O., from hard drives and stuff like that, which is why a lot of systems, modern day systems, have separate graphic processors. Because if the graphic component of it is going to slow down your CPU, which it does actually, then you can separate that as I was mentioning earlier about those mobile phones with the two processors. Well, have all the graphic, the GPU process all the graphic stuff. So we don't have to worry about all the look and feel and experience, which means your screen is going to refresh faster and your performance in terms of the GUI components are going to run much higher, more efficient, and it won't slow down your processor which is why you want to get a system that has a separate GPU on it. And you want a separate GPU memory because you want the GPU to use its own set of memory to keep track of its program counter and to do its own scheduler and to have all of its own functionality. If you share the GPU memory with the main memory, it cuts down on the amount of memory you have because the GPU is going to be using that memory. So on the cheaper systems, there's no GPU and there's no well, there's no GPU. There's not going to be any GPU memory either. <laughs> uh, and then your shared, usually on the box when you buy the computer, it says shared graphics memory. You don't want shared. 
And because share means you don't have a separate graphic processor probably, and if you do, it's still sharing the memory, which means, and I'll talk about main memory in another lecture, but it means you've now reduced the amount of resources that are available for the CPU <laughs> as well as the processing and everything else that's going on because you're dedicating it to the graphics, and if you're not using it all, it's wasted. So usually when it's shared, you got four gigs, they take a gig right off the top. It's over there. And then you only have three gigs, really, that's available. You don't really have four gigs. You have three gigs because one gig is dedicated to GPU, and it's not usable. It just gets dusty. just hangs out there unless you're using it for the GPU. So what you want is four gigs if you want to buy a system that has four gigs on it without taking a gig off of it. But long story short, um, you want to minimize uh, the amount of processing and the amount of context switching, maximize the performance and the user experience. So you're going to come up with this configuration that's going to help you do it. So a semi, uh, so a supercomputer aims to finish as many jobs as possible. We want interactions. We want multiple users in a Windows system. Um, so we want the CPU to switch between different jobs and give you the illusion that you have a dedicated CPU for each one of the programs that you're running. So which is the best CPU scheduling algorithm? Well, that's a good question, and that's an age-old question that people have been wondering about for years. Uh, there's no hard, set, fast answer to that. Still isn't. There's a lot of research. In fact, if you decide to get a doctorate in computer science, you can focus entirely on CPU schedulers and still have many problems to solve and probably end up with a really good topic, actually, for your dissertation because it's not solved yet. So there's no, there's no rocket science. There's no, there's no solution for this, which is actually kind of interesting. So you're going to simulate one yourself uh, for this assignment. Uh, so one way to find out is to simulate different ones and compare them with different types of jobs. And uh, what you're going to do in this assignment is two parts. So number one, you're going to implement a CPU scheduler simulation to compare two schedulers that are going to be described. I don't know if I'm going to get to the schedulers today. Might might not get to them till next week. Uh, but we have uh, this assignment's not due till August 22nd, so you have plenty of time to do this one. Or you can read the chapter. So you're going to simulate. You're not going to actually have to write an efficient scheduler. You're not actually, but you're simulating it. But you can do it in a programming language, like Java or C++ or any language you want, because it doesn't have to use processes. It's a simulation or a demonstration. You're writing a demo. So you're going to pretend like you're writing this CPU scheduler. And you're going to have this concept of a job running, which could just be nothing more than um, I don't know, a counter or something. And then uh, you're going to create a one to two page report that describes your evaluation of these different schedulers. And did one work better than the other? Which algorithm was better than the other for a given purpose? So you don't have to make one that's efficient. You can make one that runs slowly. You can don't worry about, you know, trying to solve the problem because it's not solvable. <laughs> of um, writing the best CPU scheduler on Earth. So your simulation is going to look something like this. So a job can be defined as an arrival time and a burst time. So the arrival time is when did the user select to run it? Or when did you select to run it? So you have an arrival time and you have a burst time. And then you have a sequence of jobs. Job number one, two, three, four. So job number one here arrived at time zero and it requires a burst time of 100. What's a burst time? How much CPU time does it need? 100. So this is job number one. Job number two, this looks like it arrived in order. Oh, these two guys arrived at the same time. These guys arrived at two. Well, what's two? It could be clock ticks. It could be time. It's a sequence. Zero, one, two, three. So these both of these guys arrived at the same time. They arrived in second place. And uh, this one needs 55, this one needs 45. This one arrived fifth. Well, what happened to third and fourth? Who knows? It waited. The user went to lunch, came back, or I don't know, probably that's not too much time. Maybe they just took a sip of coffee and then they clicked again. <laughs> and it only requires 10. So the first job derived at zero requires 100, yada, yada, second job. So assume that the time is divided out into millisecond units doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be real time. You can totally fix this information as well. So your simulation should first generate a sequence of jobs. You have to have something to run. So you're going to generate this list. 
You could do it to hard set it, just create the list, or you could read it from a file, or you could do whatever you want with it. The burst lengths can be determined by selecting the random number if you wanted to as well, if you don't want to hard set it. There should also be a minimum job length of two milliseconds, which means you don't want this to be like one or zero. If it's zero, zero, or if it's anything zero, why is it in the scheduler? <laughs> so put two on there, two or more. Uh, so the total burst duration of the job is two milliseconds plus whatever value is selected for the exponential. So don't really worry about the components of here. Simulate it so that you have a bunch of jobs. So your program should simulate the arrival of it and then the stopping of it. Once the jobs have been generated, you're going to compare the performance with these different scheduling algorithms. And we're going to go back to that slide in a few minutes, and that's the comparison. Those, that's the slide that shows you the comparison information. So you can write one program that runs both algorithms, or you can write two separate programs. You can use any programming language that you want. What do you want to use for your comparison? You want to use CPU utilization that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Average job throw put per second or millisecond, depending upon what time frame you're working with. Average job turnaround. And this is, way, this is page 157 of the textbook. So here's page 157, <laughs> which is why I wanted to bring up that assignment. This is the criteria that you're looking at. Oh, hold on one second. I think we're going to do attendance. So let me pause this. All right, so let's finish up the criteria for today. <clears throat> I probably will not get into the algorithms, but I will finish up the criteria. All right, so scheduling and criteria. Hello, we're back. This is how, hello, this is how we are going to, uh, on the assignment that you're simulating. You're writing a demonstration. It's a simulation. You're not writing a scheduling algorithm unless you're, a PhD person and you're going to write a scheduling algorithm, but you're not going to do that. You're going to write a simulation, a demonstration. And uh, what are you going to do? You're going to measure two different algorithms against each other and use some criteria to see which one's better than the other. Here's your criteria. We want to maximize CPU utilization, which means how much time did your algorithm spend not processing jobs? Well, that's going to determine how much did the algorithm actually use the CPU, so which is the CPU utilization, keeps track of, uh, keeps the CPU as busy as possible. I mean, we want to make it run hot. We want to make it run constantly. And we don't want to have it like, wait, okay, here's another job, wait, here's another job. So that's one of the things you're going to need to measure is uh, how long did it run. We also have throughput, which is the number of processes that completed their execution per time unit. How much are we completing? Meaning we have five jobs, did all five of them complete um, every minute or every millisecond? Did we get something completed? Well, isn't this sort of related? Throughput sort of related to CPU utilization. How you define how you're going to measure it is completely up to you. How you're going to measure the throughput? Well, you can keep track of how many jobs were scheduled and how many processes actually ran and what did it actually create? What did it do? Well, then we have turnaround time. And turnaround time is the amount of time to execute a particular process. So the process came in at zero. It needed 100 milliseconds, and it took 150 milliseconds for it to complete. So that would be turnaround time of 150. Well, what is that? Yeah, and the throw would be one. The CPU utilization would probably be 100 with 50 milliseconds left for something else. What's the something else? It's going to be perhaps uh, context switching or maybe it's dispatcher latency, or maybe it's another thing that got put in there. Because just because it takes a certain amount of time to run something doesn't necessarily mean that that's how long it's going to take for it to actually run. You know, it's kind of like saying, you know, oh, it takes five minutes to get from here to there on uh, 280. And how long does it really take? Well, 20 minutes. <laughs> but if there were no traffic on the road, it would take five minutes. Sometimes it does take five minutes. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it takes 20 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half. All that other stuff that happened, well, there was an accident, or, you know, we had traffic, or it was rush hour, or something, which is what's going to happen with your scheduler. Some of these other things are going to get in the way. Um, we also have waiting time. Well, that's stuck in traffic. <laughs> so if it really does take five minutes to get from point A to point B, and it took 20 minutes, 
you had 15 minutes that you were sitting there probably not going anywhere. You are waiting for something. Well, for the car in front of you to start moving again, probably. Um, so the amount of time the process has been waiting in the ready queue. It hasn't been able to run. And then response time, well, that's the amount of time it takes from when a request was submitted until the first response <coughs> is produced. No output. This is for time-sharing environments. If we don't have a time-sharing environment, we have serial processing. Process comes in, toop, it runs. Process comes in, toop, it runs. But if we have uh, five processes and you're number six and you came in, there's a time in which you haven't entered into the queue yet. <laughs> you haven't started the process yet. That's your response time. It's how long did it take before the uh, dispatcher figured out that you were there waiting. So that's kind of like how, uh, you know, you go in. You get some of those things, you know, where, um, for example, you uh, go in and you pull a ticket and you're waiting with the ticket. That's your response time. How long did it take him from the you call your number before you can get, start getting processed? Because you're in a ticket kind of environment. Like, you know, when you go to a county, here, take a ticket, take a number. You take a number and you wait. <laughs> Well, how long did it take? That's the response time for them to respond. And then you come up to the counter, and it's like the DMV. Come up to the counter, and they say, I need to process registration. Okay, and then your time actually starts. Here's another number. And this number, you sit down and you wait for your this number to be called. But you're in the system already, because you got a number. Well, there's that time you get when you arrive at the DMV where you're waiting in line just to get the number. That's the response time. So... So optimization criteria, as I mentioned before, we want to maximize the CPU utilization. We want to use it as much as possible. We want to maximize the throughput, get as many jobs through the system as possible in the shortest amount of time. Minimize the turnaround time. How long did it take to, uh, for this process to run versus that process to run versus that one? Turnaround time is the total time. So it's the time it, take, it took to process, the time it took to wait to get processed, the response time, and all the other stuff that was put in there that it was not running, all calculated together, that's the turnaround time. We want to minimize the wait, so we want to minimize that turnaround time. Minimize the waiting time. We don't want the process to wait five days before <laughs> it can actually process, which is impossible in an operating system. And then minimize the response time. The longer it takes for the process to even get into the system, then the longer it's going to take for the thing to actually run. So all of these affect the efficiency. All of these affect the user experience because nothing is going to happen. The user, what am I using my computer for? I double clicked on it and my response time was too slow and my wait time was too slow and the turnaround time was too slow. And then you go and you buy another computer because your computer's too slow. <laughs> So it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So. so we have a bunch of scheduling algorithms that we can go through. I can start the algorithms today or I can start them next time. I'll give it to you. What did you say? OK, a show of hands. <laughs> actually, I don't even have to show hands. We can actually, this is, you know, it, it's kind of early. However, it's a better stopping point. If I start in with the first come first, then I have to compare that with the other one. Then I have to compare that with another. I got about six of them. I'm going to compare. So what I'm going to do is save this for next week because when I start in with half of it, I need it all in one sitting. Otherwise, you can't see the comparison that happens between all of them. You get stuck. So besides, you guys were good, and we just had our attendance. So we can. Uh, well, we're done for today. How's that? Um. So think about the assignment. If you have any questions on the assignments, you can let me know. Uh, that actually was assignment number two that we looked at, CPU scheduler. Yeah? Actually, I don't, we don't know any language. At least two of us, we don't know the languages. Don't know any programming languages. If you don't know any programming languages, you can write what I call pseudocode. Pseudocode is going to be like fake language. The same thing I recommended for the first assignment. All right, so this is a very good question, a very good topic that just came up. If you're not a programmer, you don't know anything about programming, the same thing I recommended for the first assignment, you can use for the second one here as well. Which means you're not going to have to write the code, but you have to describe the code. How would you implement it? 
This one might be actually easier to do that with than the first one. So you still have to pick two scheduling algorithms. You might not be able to simulate it, so you'll have to do all of the analysis on your own, and you have to pretend like you could simulate it, and come up with some scenarios and map out the two scenarios, and then write the pseudocode or you know sentences and words to describe what you would implement. Ideally, if you're a computer science major, you should or yeah. have some computer science background. You should want to program, like to program, work with it that way. However, I do understand there's a lot of crossover with different majors in this class. So um, you are, feel free to complete it as much as possible in any language that you want, any programming environment, or any non-programming environment, as long as you make an attempt to actually do a real comparison. And do it yourself. Don't cut and paste something off of the internet. So. Yeah. Um, so that's assignment number two. Actually, let me take a look at three just to, because now I'm kind of curious. We have a few minutes here. So let's see. Number three, I believe, is a paper, but let's just take a look here. Uh, no, number three is process synchronization. Actually, you can do the process synchronization one too, actually, because this one is on a simulation. And again, you're going to have the same problem. It would be nice if you were able to learn a programming language. That would, might actually solve a lot of your problems. <coughs> but uh, assignment number three, I'll spend a few minutes on this one too, is uh, from chapter six. It's on process synchronization. Remember the IPC stuff we just finished? That's the content that you needed for this assignment. So you're going to create a console-based application, you know, one that works with a, you know, just regular prompt, no GUI, that uh, creates two threads, a producer and a consumer, in any programming language that you want. I do it in Java, actually. The producer opens up a file and repeatedly copies values to a circular buffer. So we're going to do a CP, or a copy command. Copy one file from one location, put it into another location. You can actually accomplish this. This one is not a simulation. You can actually do this one. So you have the producer that opens up the file, copies it up into a buffer. You have the consumer that reads the buffer and writes it to a file that opens up the output file and writes the buffered information to the file. Both the producer and the consumer use a random number of bytes to put into a uh, buffer. So it's a, not a fixed size buffer. It could be a variable length buffer. Um, for each one of the copied iterations, it'll put in n number of bytes. And the number of bytes should be random. Here's a random function that you can use in Java or C++ actually to accomplish that. If the producer is unable to write to the buffer, then it has to wait because maybe the buffer is empty or maybe... Uh, you know, the is, if the producer is unable to write to the buffer because it does not contain enough empty elements or empty spaces, it doesn't have any room to write to it, then it needs to wait for the consumer to consume. So it should trigger the consumer to say, hey, consume it. I'm done writing. If the consumer is unable to read because there's nothing in there, because uh, the producer hasn't produced, then it should proceed to the next iteration and let the um, producer produce something. In terms of the exception, once the producer has already read the entire file, it should stop working. And once the consumer doesn't have anything else to generate, it shouldn't need to consume anything else anymore. So it, it stops as well. And then you basically produced a copy. So when the program completes, the output file should be the exact copy of the input file. And the exact syntax of the program should be something like, or the syntax of the program should be followed in terms of Copy file, input, output. You can put the random number in here if you want, and the, the generation. You can make it random, or you can fix this. It can just read and write a certain amount. It makes it more interesting when you randomize it. And then the size of the buffer. You can actually specify how big to make the buffer, so put a cap on it. Otherwise, what ends up happening is you might have the producer read the entire file, put it into a buffer, it stops working. And then the consumer goes to the buffer, reads the file, and writes it back out. And then it stops working, and then you have no synchronization. So what you want to do is try and simulate the synchronization that's occurring between the producer and the consumer. 
makes it more interesting. If you can do that, then you can actually work with the interprocess communication. So you're representing the producer-consumer model in terms of the IPC, the information that I gave you. And you're doing it in the form of a copy, copy command that you're creating. Um, so copy file is the name of the executable. Input is the name of the input file. Output is the name of the output file. N is the maximum number of bytes to copy in at a given iteration. So it, we are putting a, a ceiling on how many bytes so it doesn't read the whole entire file all in one shot. And M is the size of the buffer. So the buffer is only 20 bytes long. And N might be 1 or it might be 10 or 15. So it's a random, N is a random number. And if it hits 20, then you're done. It, it, there's nothing left to put in there, so the producer should stop producing, and the consumer needs to read all that stuff out. But the producer can produce, and then the consumer can consume. You'll actually get a race condition problem out of this, where you'll be, both of them will be racing to the buffer at the same time. Whoever gets there first <laughs> is going to be able to read or write. If the consumer keeps getting there and there's nothing there, then to prevent the race from happening over and over again, so to let the producer actually produce something, you got to stop the consumer. So it deals with the prevention of that particular race condition, and it's a basic scenario of the reader, excuse me, of the producer-consumer model. In the book, there's actually a simulation of this already, so you can take a look at that actually and use that as a basis, or uh, go blindly and write your own if you want to. So you can probably do assignment number three as well. You don't want to wait with four until I give you the scenarios. Excuse me, you want to wait with two until I give you the scenarios. But you could probably do three. We've covered that information already. Number four is on um, <clears throat> is a deadlock avoidance. It's another IPC problem scenario. So on the deadlock avoidance problem, we are going to take a look at this one here. It's another program. They're all sort of the same kind of concept. They're all a bunch of programs. On this one, uh, you've hired by the CS department to write code to synchronize the professor and his students during office hours. So you have a bunch of students who show up. It's a sleeping barber, actually. You have a bunch of students who show up at the office hours. And the professor, of course, wants to uh, take a nap if no students are around. And, uh, and then if students are here, only one student at a time can ask a question. So you're going to implement these rules so to synchronize the professor's time. So only one person is speaking at one time. Each person's question is answered by the professor in the order or whatever order the people speak in. So you get a question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. No student asks another question before the professor is done answering the previous question. So you write uh, four procedures. You're going to have an answer start, answer done, question start, question done. So you have shared resources. You have one teacher with multiple students, and you're sharing among the, the student, the one, one teacher you're sharing among the multiple students for a question answer. So it's, um, it's, it's a scenario with multiple running processes instead of just two. So it's a different model. So the professor loops, uh, loops running the code of answering, answer start, answer, gives an answer, answer done, until all of the students have all of their questions answered. So you can use a command line program for this, uh, make it easy, use any language that you want, and again simulate it in form of pseudocode if you don't know how to write source code for it. It's actually easier to do all of these programs if you know how to program. <laughs> They're pretty classic scenarios. The uh, last one, I believe, is a writing assignment, and it's on memory. So let me take a look at this one real quick. I'll go through these again as we go through um, the material, but it's a nice, good spot to see what's in these assignments, actually. Just to... This one is a paper. So we haven't talked about memory yet, but eventually we're going to talk about memory. When we get to the memory chapter, you'll be comparing and contrasting the different types of memory. <coughs> so instead of a programming assignment, you're going to write a report, and the report that you're going to write is going to be a comparison. So it should be two to, two to four pages double-spaced. This one you can't write a program for. Um, you're going to either create a chart or you're going to 
basically write some words, and you're going to cite your references and not cut and paste from the internet. You're going to compare main memory and contiguous memory allocation and peer segmentation with peer paging, which we haven't talked about yet. We haven't talked about any of these concepts yet. So the last assignment, number five, is a writing assignment. So, so the ones you could be working on then would be assignment number three, actually, at this point, and then wait till next week on assignment number two. You should have one done already at this point. I would think so, and then uh, four. You uh, you could probably do four as well. So four is on the teacher student scenario. So three and four are definitely doable at this point. So questions, comments, or concerns? Yeah. I checked on the Unix. They give you cl the the campus has cloud services without Unix. There's no programming languages out there, so it's not going to be any good. So what I would recommend is using Java and installing it on a Windows machine and not trying, if you don't have access to a Linux box or Unix box, we don't have access either. So what you're going to need to do is um, get, download one of those ISOs for a boot disk. They call it a live Linux disk. You can boot your system to Linux and then put a USB drive in there and copy, write everything to the USB drive and then simulate it or run it through the ISO that you're booting to, or install Linux or Unix on a computer that you have, or use a MacBook. You can do it on a MacBook, or do it in Java. <laughs> Only the first assignment actually specifies, so you can do the first assignment in Java if you want to simulate it, because Java will support thread programming. The other ones, you can't do it unless you have a Unix system. So feel free to change the language to something that will work for you. So, um, but the cloud services that they give us, they don't have C++ on it. It's, it's ridiculous. I guess it's meant for web programming. But, uh, so. Any other questions? That was a good question. Anything else for today? No, then I will see you next week. All right, we're done. <laughs>